When Steel Talks, everybody listens. Now, yes. All right. As I said, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out in such large numbers. And I also want to thank uh, Les Slater and the Folk Arts Institute for inviting me. Um, um, my contribution is simple, but I hope it would um, encourage others to um, reminisce on our icon, the Mikey Sparrow. I entitled it Growing Up with Sparrow. And the reason I did that is because ever since I was a little boy, uh, Sparrow has been dominant, not only in my life, but I guess in the life of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, I was lucky to be born behind a bridge, which is East Jar River. No longer has that good character, but at the time I grew up, it was a community and we were all protected. Uh, I had a couple of advantages. One, I was born in a community. Uh, two, I was born at a time when self-government and nationalism was in the air. You, know, you had um, politicians trying to get uh, their self-determination and independence from the home country, England. And education was very important to all of us. You know, we will focus on that because it seems to be a way to gain our freedom. But lastly, Sparrow was very important. And I remember the first time I met Sparrow was uh, I had an uncle living on uh, Simeon Road, and his house was opposite Sparrow. Now, I didn't know Sparrow was the dominant person that he became today. But um, I would see him sitting in his gallery, and I would, you know, my grandmother would send me to my uncle, as happened to every young boy, every summer. And I would go there, and I would come outside in the morning, I would see Sparrow sitting down, and sometimes I would see his kids playing. I never went to his uh, house, but I would see him. Then I found out later that um, Sparrow's mother was a Baptist, or is a Baptist. And my mother is also a Baptist, and they both attended the same church. Or, or, sir, or. So I had these two connections. One, you know, happened to see Sparrow all the time, and the religious aspect. And then I remember um, Sparrow had opened his own recording company on Frederick Street. Now, for those of us my age and above, we had what is called three arcades on Frederick Street. We had one down Frederick Street, close to um, the Cipriani statue, and then we had two above Duke Street, one on the left, which H.P. Singh store, and one on the right, opposite, which is now Royal Castle. That the entrance. And Sparrow had his recording company in that area. And one day I'm coming from school, and I just stopped by the record store and gazing around the records. And Sparrow was there and he says, um, you're, you're buying something? I said, no, you know me. He said, okay. He said, come here. So I came. He says, uh, you want to join my fan club? Well, fortunately, I was a member of a group called Tiny Mites. For those of us, again, my age, Tiny Mites was this young group that the Guardian newspaper had sponsored. And we would write articles and we would go around, you know, talking to people and getting information. <coughs> so I knew what a fan club was. So I said, yes. I said, okay. And I signed a form. And my job, I became secretary, and my job was to bring members, you know, young people like myself. The next thing I know is Sparrow had printed a book. And I brought it with me. And in this book, he listed his 20 most popular calypsos. <coughs> I don't know if anyone has seen it, or, but in this, he put all his calypsos in this book, and then at the back he has um, Sparrow Fan Club. <laughs> you know, you would sign up your name, your address, and then you send it in, and then you become a member. So, uh, Sparrow was very important to me. And I say this because as a young man, um, my first role model was my grandfather. 
but the next male role model I had was Sparrow. I mean, Sparrow expressed my feelings as a young man in his calypsos. He sung about love, women, <laughs> politics, nationalism, uh, Pekong, and everything that I felt as a young boy, Sparrow expressed it in his calypsos. Now I'll give you an example. I had an uncle uh, live uh, Pity Boo, Maloney Street, I believe. Uh, again, my grandmother, you know, she keeps sending me around these different family members because I was a problem in the summer, so she says, you know, go by your uncle, go by your aunt, go ahead. So I was staying at my uncle in uh, Maloney Street, and opposite my uncle, there's this pretty little girl, I'm about 11, 12, that's sitting in her gallery. And I'm in, you know, my uncle's sitting. And of course, it was love at first sight. And the music that I remembered that allowed me to express that was one of Sparrow Calypso's, Dorothy. <laughs> and the part of it that really got me was when he sang, uh, Darling, you are the one I love. You are my turtle dove. Let me hold you tight, tight, tight. Darling, with all my might. We live in harmony, oh, Dorothy. But that was my feeling. <laughs> and her name was Dorothy, her name was Agnes, and I sing very well. But again, that's how Sparrow influenced my life, you know, my love life at that time, right? So, the next thing I know is, you know, her father and my uncle were friends. So, you know, one thing led to another. So, that's my boy, that's my girlfriend. So we start hanging out. Later on, Sparrow start introducing a new concept. And that was he began to hold his Calypso openings at the Queen's Hall. Now again, for those of us, the Queen's Hall was our epic concert hall at that time. And around Christmas time, Sparrow would, um, you know, open up his Calypso tent, he would bring all his Calypsonians to the, to the hall, and they would put on this show for two or three days. So that was the first time I went to a concert to see an entertainer, right? So I was there, he put on a great show, and later on, he brought up an album. Now, every Trinidad, and I guess every immigrant knows, when you're leaving home, you bring something that is most precious you because you don't know if you're going back. So mm -hmm. you want to have this holding with you. The two things I bought was the book and this album. Mm -hmm. Now you see I have it in a little plastic. <laughs> and it's been like this for the last maybe 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. And he released this album, the whole album in those days. Every album used to be well written and you can count on all the tunes being good. It's not like a one tune album, right? He had about 10 or 12 tunes on this. And every tune he had a modulation, a fool on his money, don't go Joe, Dan is the man, we need a crisis, you name it, right? Now these calypsos were talking to me as a young man, because I had always liked reading. And when you read, you miss it. And by being attached to reading, when Sparrow sung a calypso, I memorized the words, right? So the style that Sparrow had was very important to me. As again, as I said, being from behind the bridge, you have steel band, you have parties, you have Saga Girl, you have Saga Boy. It was a real, completed com community. Sparrow emphasized that kind of uh, uh, attraction. Now, steel band, Sparrow had belonged, I don't know if he was a member, but you can count and come into Carnival, on Carnival Tuesday, when Trinidad All-Stars, at that point in time, they were situated on Charlotte Street at the top of Maple Leaf Club, in what they call the Garrett. And I remember as a young boy, I wasn't playing mass at the time, but I went to see All-Stars. And I'm standing right on the side of the sidewalk, pavement. And there's all these women 
behind me. All of a sudden, I hear somebody say, Look, Sparrow! <laughs> <laughs> At that time, again, Sparrow had bought a new car. And he came down Charlotte Street, driving this car. Right? A propel, right? And I mean, the women would, I mean, you see the beatles and all people, you know, the young girls would be you know, screaming and whatnot. These women were just, you know, ecstatic about Sparrow. And that made an impression on me because it, it showed that the man was loved by the people, and particularly the women. I keep saying Sparrow song to women, for women. Most of Sparrow Calypso's until maybe 68, 69, were about women in different forms and fashion. So Sparrow had that influence on me. Now, in the 60s, after we had tried Federation, the Federation didn't last. And it was Sparrow we looked to for who to blame. <laughs> and who caused the Federation to fall down? Of course, Sparrow said in Jamaica. And we all said, yes. <laughs> so Sparrow influenced us in so many ways that we didn't believe that Sparrow would become 80 years old. No. We felt Sparrow would be the way he is like this forever. <laughs> right? Especially getting sick, no way. So Sparrow had that type of influence. Again, as I said, as a young man, you're looking for role models. One of the things that Sparrow introduced that was the big secret of Trinidad, and he introduced it in his song, was class. And Trinidad is a very class-oriented society. Race, yes, but class is what we focus on. And Sparrow and his Calypso, the old cast, focus on that aspect. And that taught me how class-oriented we were. Of course, he was referring to the steel band and how they were not accepted in the society and what happened and what didn't happen. So you have these four areas that Sparrow covered in my life. My love life, style, women, and class. I would like to think that Sparrow's contribution has enabled the development of, of our beloved country, Trinidad and Tobago. And when I say contribution, the way Sparrow expressed a song and the topic in the song, and Sparrow would say, if Sparrow says so, it's it's so, so. so. and we believed it, right? So, another aspect that Sparrow connected with me is my father is from Grenada. Mm. Now, at the time I was growing up, that was a big secret. <laughs> because if you're from a small island, or you're connected to a small island, you know the pecan and the fatty and what they go. So we had that type of connection. Uh, I would like to say that the mighty Sparrow, Slinger Francisco, Birdie, has given my life a very, very important element and discipline. And that discipline was, Sparrow was never late for a show. He was always on time. The Sparrow says he's coming at 8 o'clock, he's there. Right? As long as you perform your end of the bargain, Sparrow will perform his end. And there was no disappointment. That was important to me. And I think I've carried those traits throughout my life. So, this symposium that is being done here with, by the Folk Institute is something that I treasure because Sparrow, the mighty Sparrow, has made an important contribution, not just to my life, but to our country and to the citizens as a whole. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful. The format that we are uh, employing this evening is that we will allow, if, if there are any, we will allow just a couple of questions.
after the first three presentations and then more questions than that at the, after the last presentation is done. So if anyone wants to ask a uh, colleague uh, uh, something, uh, feel free. Sure. Yes, sir. How can I get a copy of that book? <laughs> we talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Hewitt, yes. you're saying that um, Sparrow influenced you with women. Are you a womanizer? No, sir, I'm not. <laughs> I think I will use my job as a mayor. <laughs> no, no, I mean, Sparrow gave me tools. <laughs> And one thing I'd have to say is that you said that you didn't think that he would um, become the 80. And the number of times we've heard that he died, we think. Oh, yes. It seemed like he was very important. And he was very important. Anything else? Thank you, Kali uh, Kiewit.